My name is Sean Hill, and I work at Fordham University. I'm an instructional technologist for digital pedagogy and digital scholarship. And in that role, one of the things I do is I work with faculty and I teach uh, students, whether graduate or undergraduate, how to visualize data and also how to construct digital maps. And, and I must say to, to Zachary that the portal open data has been very, very important and very instrumental. Um, it's just been super useful for, for me to use as an instructor when teaching people skills about mapping, uh, visualizing data and, and analyzing and thinking about data and the ways that we can learn more about our community and society. So the uh, project for today that I would like to present is a um, kind of a side gig I've been working on. And the project's called Polemical Mapping. And in particular, I'm focused on um, a series of maps that came out from uh, New York City between 2017 and 2021. And these maps were focused on uh, the New York City state of homeless services put out by the Department of Homeless Services or, or DHS. And in addition to being an employee of Fordham University, I also am a co-founder of an organization called the Greater Harlem Coalition. And if you would like a copy of this presentation, or <clears throat> have any follow-up questions or anything like that, you can reach me at greaterharlemcoalition at gmail.com. This slide will be coming up at the end of the presentation as well, but I'd be happy to carry this conversation on both after this presentation or after I've finished. We can talk then, but also later on, if you have other questions or thoughts you want to, to add. And the Greater Harlem Coalition uh, began as a small uh, collection of three block associations in Harlem. One was in East Harlem, Central Harlem, and the other was in West Harlem. And since then, for the last over the last four years, four and a half years, it has grown to encompass over 120 uh, block associations, faith-based organizations, not-for-profits, small businesses and drug treatment providers in Harlem and East Harlem. And if you know anything of the geography of, of Manhattan or Northern Manhattan in particular, we encompass community boards nine, 10 and 11. We essentially span from the Hudson River over to the Harlem River and, uh, and work with issues and concerns there. In particular, our coalition is focused on systemic issues that impact our community and trying to address through legislation, outreach, activism, and data um, where we see oversaturation occurring in this uh, storied community of color. So I wanted to start today by referring to a really uh, wonderful quote that comes from a document I'm going to be referring to throughout the uh, presentation tonight. The document is called Doing Our Fair Share, and it was produced by the New York City uh, Council. And I love this quote. It says, New York City's fair share system is failing to meet its charter established goals. And I should just note that the fair share charter um, and the goals that it's talking about initially came um, about during the Giuliani era. It does not provide either process transparency or distributional equity. All right, and I will come back to this as we go on. So that document, which you see the cover of on the right-hand side, uh, came out in 2017 from the New York City uh, City Council and was looking at the distribution of city services, city programs, city funded uh, projects, et cetera, throughout the five boroughs and asking very difficult questions about why some neighborhoods have different kinds of resources than other neighborhoods, why certain neighborhoods get certain kind of facilities different from other neighborhoods, et cetera. And contemporaneously, the document on the left Turning the Tide on Homelessness also came out in 2017. This one was produced by the Mayor de Bill de Blasio's administration and was a major policy document. It came out to put a kind of line in the sand um, about from this point forward. It also was meant to announce at some, at some level 
the uh, second term of Mayor de Blasio and how he was intending and his administration were intending to address the crisis of homelessness um, as they saw it during his second term. And that document, the one on the left that was produced by the administration, Department of Homeless Services in particular, included five maps that I would like to take a look at. First of all, it included three what I'm calling pseudo choropleth maps. I think if you look at the map on the right hand side, you think initially that you may be looking at a choropleth map. Choropleth map, of course, uh, assigns different regions geographic regions, spaces, or places with different values of a particular color or even different colors to represent intensity of a particular phenomenon, a particular thing, um, query. In other words, representing visually some kind of quantifiable data point. And a quick glance at the uh, map on the right-hand side would uh, lead most people, I think, to assume that whatever is being visualized is more abundant in Manhattan, and that perhaps Staten Island has the second most abundant uh, amount of that thing, whatever that thing is, whereas the Bronx has, has the least. And yet this is not the case. If you take a look at the map, particularly the one on the left, in blue, you'll notice that there's a very sort of strange um, dissonance that's occurring both visually when you're expecting Manhattan to mean more or to be represented, represent more, and yet you learn that Staten Island, in fact, is the borough with the least amount of this thing, this thing that we're um, quantifying here, in this case, shelter programs. So the Bronx has the most shelter programs and is the palest, and yet Staten Island is the second most intense and has the least number of shelters. So these pseudo maps are extremely problematic because they mislead the viewer into thinking they're looking at a true choropleth map, but in fact, they are looking at uh, a rather arbitrary decision about using one value, pardon me, one color with different values to simply distinguish borough from borough to borough. This document, Turning the Tide, also included two undisambiguated symbol maps. We probably all are familiar with symbol maps. The most common symbols used are simple dots, but you can imagine there may be uh, a symbol of a coffee cup to represent cafes or a little house icon to represent homes, etc. And symbol maps generally are there to show you where in space a particular object, place, entity, building, phenomenon, person is located. And if the cartographer um, chooses to do so, sometimes the size of the symbols or the color of the symbols themselves vary in order to indicate a, a second dimension, a capacity, a volume, um, a number of employees, a number of coffees sold in a given day, the number of pounds of, of coffee purchased, for example. And I think you can all imagine that map, that hypothetical map of cafes in New York City, where the size of the coffee cup would indicate the number of patrons served or the number of cups sold in a given day. The uh, map on the left is uh, showing us uh, home base locations. But there is no distinction between a facility that might have only two employees compared to a facility that might have 120, for example. The map on the right, which I'm going to be talking about at greater length, is even more confused because there are symbols, in this case squares, located in a number of community districts, but not in relationship to where these phenomena, these items actually occur in space. In other words, this, the symbols are simply located somewhere, anywhere within a community district, but not indicative of where that particular thing is located. And doing our fair share, that document that was produced by the city council also, interestingly, included five maps. First of all, it included two correct or, or pure, perhaps, choropleth maps. I think looking on the left-hand side at the two maps, one from 1999 on the left, 
one from 2015 on the right, and the scale that is down at the bottom in the legend, I think it's pretty clear that you can understand almost immediately that the bright red indicates a density of residential beds, and yellow represents a fairly, um, a, almost an absence of those, and varying degrees of orange, yellow, and red indicate intensity. And you can look at one map on the left, compared to the map on the right, and you can almost immediately see that the northern part of Staten Island, for example, had a decrease in residential bed density over that period of years, uh, 16 years in this case. The map on the right, which is of New York City parks, um, I know Zachary formerly worked for the Parks Department, and this choropleth map is showing um, older parks facilities or spaces or jurisdiction compared to newer ones that have come into being. And so these maps tell us at, at a glance what is going on. Something has increased in density, decreased in density. Something is a new addition to a portfolio, um, et cetera, through the use of color and tone. They uh, doing your, our fair share also included uh, three disambiguated symbol maps. So these maps uh, these symbols on these maps indicate not just the location, the correct location of a particular phenomena. And let's take a look at the very uh, central one, which is of libraries, so we can see where libraries are located. But the cartographer has also changed the size of the dot to reflect the circulation capacity. And this is important because if you look at the um, lower area of the south of South Brooklyn, um, Bay Ridge and Bensonhurst, you see that there are fairly evenly spaced libraries and they are putting out a fair number of books. Compare that to, for example, easternmost Bronx, which also has libraries, but are not circulating a, a fairly large numbers of books or material. The shelter bed map on the right hand side, I know it's a little hard to see here, but I will be showing you a larger version of it in, in a moment, um, also has the location of the shelters, the size or the capacity of those shelters. And the one map I'm including on the left hand side, is absolutely fascinating because it shows the distribution of firehouses. And this is used by the city council to illustrate that it is possible for New York City to make decisions about the location of a city service in a way which is um, objectively as, as um, perhaps equitable as possible. In other words, the location of these firehouses has been determined by population density, by distance and time to get to various locations. And as a society, we have located those equitably throughout all different kinds of uh, ethnic neighborhoods, uh, class neighborhoods, et cetera, throughout the five boroughs. The title of the map from uh, turning the tide is uh, to start off with is one of the more confused subtitles, at least that I've seen in a while. It has cluster sites and hotels used for shelter by community districts. And I, I can sort of parse that. I'm going to be seeing community districts and I'm going to be seeing these two um, components, cluster sites and hotels, fine. But the subtitle, which is all clusters and hotels will no longer be used under this plan, seems to almost undercut the title as though we're showing you something that is going to be taken away, which is interesting in and of itself. But the map, the larger map here, uh, is is complex and, and I would argue um, difficult to actually parse or, or comprehend or understand what is being represented. And to start off, uh, you have to look at the legend down at the bottom to discover that the legend is really actually a kind of borough-based summary. So you see, for example, that Staten Island's total is both zero and zero. Um, and that may, of course, explain why, for some reason, Staten Island has been placed on the map off the west coast of northern Manhattan. Um, there are questions that come to mind immediately about why Staten Island in this, in this particular location has no um, symbols or data on it, and also why then it is the same color, more or less, um, as the Bronx is. Looking further down at South Brooklyn, 
you probably notice that there are a number of community districts which are both outlined but not uh, have no indication of the number of uh, hotels or clusters that are there. And to understand that absence, you have to read in the legend where it says community districts not listed, zero commercial hotels and zero clusters. Um, I think this is uh, particularly obscure. It's, it, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to kind of take that text and have an aha moment on the map. And you, of course, will uh, any keen observer of the geography of Brooklyn will notice uh, immediately to the left of CD9 is Prospect Park. You see Grand Army sort of sticking off uh, up at the tent, up at the top there. Um, and then the question is, well, why has uh, Prospect Park um, been represented as though it was a community district that does not have any commercial hotels or clusters located in it. Um, I think this is a great uh, shot of a detail of that map to show if you look at quickly at CD5 in the Bronx and CD10 in the Bronx on the right hand side, it, it is impossible to kind of grasp or to really get the idea that CD5 has 33 times. 33 times the amount of buildings, shelter buildings that CD10 has. And again, the problem with parks on the left-hand side, you'll notice that Central Park is looking like a very long community district, somehow sandwiched between the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. Note that the Upper East Side does not have a single shelter building listed in this map. And this can be directly compared with the city council map that I had shown you much smaller earlier on, the symbol map. And what I love about this map is, is that we have threefold information happening and all being represented in a very comprehensible way. And if I drill down, and, and I apologize for the pixelation on the right-hand side, it's just simply the way the PDF was rendered. Um, if I drill down, it's clear that the size of the circle is showing me the capacity, right? So I know that a larger circle means there are more people living in that particular shelter uh, building. Great. The other thing I know is that the location of those circles is telling me where those shelters are located. So I can see, for example, that Inwood has no shelters being represented here, whereas Washington Heights has you know, six or seven uh, in, in the southern part below the GWB. The third thing, which I really like on this map, is that the overlap of symbols in this case is intensified by a darker green. And this helps because in many cases, city agencies, city um, uh, facilities may be co-located in their same building, simply on a different floor. They may be in, a, in an, simply in an adjacent building and virtually overlap. And the way in which the cartographer has used a darker, darker shades of green to indicate overlap is particularly powerful. And if you look on, for example, Randall's Wards Island, you can see that Wards Island not only has the two largest symbols on this entire map, but it has two of the largest overlapping one another. In other, in other words, more or less at the same location, we have a huge number of people, uh, or at least certainly a huge capacity of residential beds uh, in the shelter system. So in a technical term, this map is a hot mess. And I think that it raises three basic questions. First of all, why was this map designed with no uh, disambiguated symbols? Why was it not represented as a choropleth map? But most importantly, what has been obscured? What is this map not showing us as viewers, as citizens, trying to understand both this new policy as well as the current state of affairs? Well, the first thing that we do not learn from the turning the tide map is we don't learn the number of people who are living in the shelters. That map is a map of the number of shelters, but not, of course, their capacity. The second thing which is being obscured is the disproportionate burden that New York City's shelter system places on specific communities. I think as we were going through this presentation, you undoubtedly noticed that certain neighborhoods had more capacity or more uh, shelters, more buildings, more people, et cetera, compared to others. 
And lastly, another thing which is being obscured is the correlation between shelter distribution and the racial and economic makeup of host communities. Because as you were looking at these maps, I'm sure as observers of the New York scene, you undoubtedly noticed that certain kinds of neighborhoods with certain, with a preponderance of certain kinds of people either had more or less shelter distribution. And so I wanted now to finally bring a map that originates from New York City open data that I have created. Uh, note that this data is from 2018, so I don't, I'm not able to go back to 2017 because of the limitations of the data uh, made available by DHS. But nevertheless, this map, which is on a per capita basis, looks at the burden which single shelter, single adult shelters has on some neighborhoods and not on others, right? You can probably see Riverdale has none, Eastern Queens is none, South Brooklyn has none, Staten Island is completely devoid of single adult shelters. And this map shows very distinctly that some communities have a disproportionate burden compared to other communities. And the question I immediately asked once I had done this map is, is it also possible to look at the other kind of shelter in New York City, which of course are family shelters? And here's what you get when you map family shelters. You get a far more, and by no means perfect, but you get a more homogenous, more equitable perhaps uh, distribution. So you see that Eastern Queens, for example, now has a lot of shelters for families. You'll see Riverdale's even taking a little bit. Even Staten Island has, you know, perhaps a shelter or something for families in the northern part of, of that borough. But nevertheless, it is at least, I think, striking to see the difference between the distribution of single adult shelters versus the distribution of family shelters. If we fast forward from this period in either 2017 or 2018 to last year, this map on the right-hand side was produced by the same agency, Department of Homeless Services. And as you can see, both in, in the design and, and the way that it's presented, owes a lot to the turning the tide map on the left. Fortunately, we see that uh, Staten Island has assumed its rightful place uh, in, in geography. It has also uh, been shown as having a shelter or two uh, in its northern um, community district. We also uh, look at this and, and see that now community districts with no shelters whatsoever are being represented uh, in gray. Uh, so you see Southern Staten Island, Southern Brooklyn, uh, an enclave in sort of North Eastern Queens, for example, are in gray. They haven't managed to, to deal with uh, Prospect Park, um, Van Cortland Park, and the fact that uh, Central Park all look like um, vacant, for example, community districts, but nevertheless. But I think never when looking at this, an immediate observation is not the map, because the map is still extremely confused. The symbols do not mean anything in terms of location or capacity, size, et cetera, or type of shelter. But what we see is that large circle that says 31% fewer. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the number of buildings has been re reduced. So 31% fewer buildings. Yet you note on the right-hand side in the text, it says more or less that the strategies that the administration has employed have held the, census, uh, the shelter census numbers flat. And then they say the numbers have gone from approximately 60,000 down to 53,000. That, of course, is not 31% less, and it is not flat. So there are a little, there's a little stress there, a little kind of dissonance going on. And so the question then is, can we actually represent what has happened in terms of the shelter census information, as opposed to the 31% representing building numbers change? So if we use what is known as a gain loss choropleth map, on the left hand side, we see adult shelter population uh, increased. 
we see in the center that family shelter decreased. And this is absolutely uh, amazing. When you look at this, you see that they are two profoundly different trajectories for this different kind of shelter in New York City. Look at the number of districts on the left-hand side that gained shelter, single adult shelters, over the course of three years from, Gen from July 2018 over into January 2021. Look at, however, the family shelters and how many of those community districts being represented here decreased or lost family shelter space or populations, I should say. And lastly, the map on the right hand sh side is showing those two maps on the left combined. In other words, there's a much more kind of mixed environment where maybe perhaps half of the community districts lose population, another half gain, but the net result is an 11% decrease. So the adults, single adults increased by 21%, family shelter residents decreased by 22, but the overall combination of those decreased by 11%. And so if I was going to uh, provide a comparative map that I believe would more accurately reflect what's going on uh, from the map that is provided on the left, I would come up with something like this, using New York City open data to show between 2017, the start of the map where the 30, um, that started turning the tide, to 2021 in January, and this is what you would get. And while the city lost or closed 31% of its shelters, the population only decreased by 17%. So what we can tell from this is that more people were packed into an increase or decreasing number of shelters. And that the data, data on the left, the 31% fewer, exaggerates by two times the amount of decrease that is actually occurring when looking at individuals within the shelter system and not the buildings themselves. So to conclude, the maps that we see in turning the tide on homelessness from 2017 have presented maps that obscure the heterogeneous distribution of shelters, and in particular with the people in those shelters. It also fails to fully acknowledge the systemic inequality in the distribution of New York City's shelter systems, shelter buildings, and shelter system. And it doesn't distinguish between different kinds of shelters, which may place a greater or a lesser burden on a particular neighborhood or community. And lastly, by focusing on infrastructure, by focusing on buildings, they were able to, uh, and again, this is only in hindsight, of course, exaggerate the impact of initiatives uh, in subsequent maps that have been produced. And so you might then ask the larger question, which is why, you know, after decades uh, of existence, does New York City have such a system which is so systemically unequal in its spatial distribution. And the reasons that our organization, the Greater Harlem, um, or the conclusions that the Greater Harlem Coalition have come to is that communities chosen for shelter sites have often not had access to easily understood visualizations or complete data on the current state of shelter distribution and shelter capacity. And DHS and shelter uh, providers have also relied on the inexpensive um, price of commercial real estate in certain neighborhoods compared to others. Low-income communities of color often are burdened with weak political resistance, fractured social capital, and are often uh, the places where single adult shelters are more likely to be located. And lastly, I think that uh, shelter siting is often rationalized by referring to the larger cultural myth, which that that which is homelessness is a low income community of color issue that should be contained or policed, perhaps in those neighborhoods and not allowed 
to to be expressed or housed in this case in other wealthier and frequently whiter neighborhoods. And this, of course, brings us back to the whole question about distributional equity and whether or not the current system as it exists uh, reflects that or whether the administration was able to achieve that. And our, I think our kind of ultimate conclusion is that we have created as a society, as New Yorkers, as citizens of this country, we have created and maintained a system that traps some of the most vulnerable people in our in our society, in the poorest and the most fragile communities, and that is where they are frequently housed. And so our coalition, when asked, what do we want? We always reply that we want small scale shelters equitably located in all New York neighborhoods. And that concludes the presentation. I wanted to make a note of the two main sources of the data that was used to construct those uh, maps that I presented that were uh, produced by myself. Also to reiterate that if you would like a copy of this presentation or to discuss it after this evening, you can reach me at greaterharlemcoalition at gmail.com. And uh, to conclude, I will just say, but wait, there's more because exactly one year ago, in March 2021, DHS came out with another version, a three month later version of it, which touted the 41% decrease in facilities in, in actual shel physical shelters um, compared to what ha they had started with in 2017. So I will stop sharing the screen and we can open it up to either questions that have been posed in the chat or you can um, Unmute yourself, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm Gerald Lewis, and um, I want to thank you for putting together this this this, this resource so we can get a, a better idea of what has happened to put it to put the to put us in such a, a bad position. This is not by accident. This is well designed, and I'm hoping that we will continue to shed light on it because um, it's just time for us not to allow things to happen in New York City like this because when it happens here, it happens everywhere because we're supposed to be more sophisticated than, than this. And I'm really sad uh, as a New Yorker. I wish that uh, uh, that we would find ways to uh, stop it in this tracks right now because it's, it's, it's not good for people's psyche who are living well to see people living so uh, poorly because it's just it's bad on the psyche, it's bad on the heart. So thanks again. Well, and, and thank you for that comment. I think that's absolutely correct that we as a society have to start asking ourselves those very difficult questions about what the systems um, have. And again, this happens in a conscious and an unconscious way, right? I think that uh, people who make decisions about where a particular facility may be located may simply say to themselves, do I really want the pushback that might come from trying to put this in a community that's going to rally and, and have resources to resist? And unfortunately, some of the most vulnerable communities, uh, neighborhoods in our city are the ones that are taxed with these uh, with, with shelters that uh, become huge burdens um, and, and, and difficult places. And especially when they're very large and concentrated, because if we have an equitable distribution through all New York neighborhoods, we can reduce the stigma associated with these uh, programs and facilities and the people that are, are, are forced to engage in them. And we can also uh, begin to work on uh, citywide solutions for these very complex problems. Um, I wanted to ask a clarifying question about the the statistic of 31% fewer buildings. Was that in response to a policy where they were claiming that they had reduced the homeless population and therefore no longer needed those buildings? What was the context of that claim? I believe that the the Turning the Tide document, which presented that map, that initial map, which of course was pre-COVID, was meant as a kind of line in the sand uh, document that the Department of Homeless Services and the city as a whole was bent on reducing the number of buildings uh, that were hotel used as, or pardon me, hotels used as sites as well as cluster uh, facilities. And so once they had established that baseline, that line in the sand, 
than they were hoping. And they, it turned out to be true that over time, over four years, they were able to claim that the number of buildings had been decreased. They, it, it was very, it's very surprising to me that they have, they shied away from focusing on the people they focused on the buildings and i'm sure there's there's something going on there i'm not quite sure i'm i'm in the position to to speculate on what that is but they very distinctly focused on building and building reduction and not on the actual number of people who are enmeshed in the system julia thank you for the clarification yeah i think your your version of the map showed that um they really were obscuring something by focusing on the buildings and not actually really even claiming to be decreasing the homeless population at all with their policy. It was purely based on buildings, which is interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting because the population did decrease. My data from New York Open Data shows that it did go down by 17%, which is you know, no small number. Um, there are incredible complicating factors because of the pandemic. And I think we have to you know, take that into consideration. But it is interesting that focus on buildings as opposed to, to individuals. Anyone else? Uh, so do you have plans to, to uh, do this cartography to, 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 uh, to offer these charts uh, going forward that, that actually express this? Is, is that something uh, your organization is going to provide? That you have access to the data, right? Yes. Uh, we, uh, anyone has access to the data through the New York Open Data uh, Portal. Um, and we are going to be publishing this on the Greater Harlem Coalition's website, which is greaterharlem.nyc, and we'll be putting that up uh, shortly. And we're hopefully going through a, a website redesign, so maybe that will be coming up in, in the short while as well. How did your, your studies work with the libraries and uh, the takeover of the libraries? Do you see any, any patterns there? You know, we actually haven't, our organization hasn't looked at libraries. We haven't actually uh, done a study of that. I, it's something that I'm intrigued by. I would like to take a look at, but so far I haven't taken a look at that. This is, I think it's mainly, uh, this is a real estate way of getting so much in the developing areas. This is uh, it's like a diamond, finding diamonds in the in the in, in the wide open field where it hasn't been discovered yet, so now they they have found found ways to make this happen. So those properties, such as schools and churches, are part of the big developers when they buy into invest into uh, these communities. They see these uh, these great uh, structures. And, and Gerald, I would agree that I think almost almost every New York story is ultimately a real estate story. And, and it doesn't take much to, to scratch any particular issue, concern, or, or problem. And you often find real estate um, uh, lurking somewhere. Um, and I had mentioned in the talk about how the price of commercial real estate impacts where shelters have been located. But it's also true that communities that suffered uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s from disinvestment, uh, white flight, um, um, all kinds of uh, uh, problems associated with, with, uh, you know, the ur with urban blight have meant that there are large spaces in those neighborhoods where development is possible. And so it's far easier to put a new facility into one of those places than to put one in admittedly into the Upper East Side. I mean, how many vacant lots do we know of in the Upper East Side? It's, it's built out. Whereas in my neighborhood in East Harlem, there are plenty. You just, you know, you just go down this block, you go down that block, and there's, there's plenty of real estate there. So that's another factor that has undoubtedly impacted and influenced why so many communities of color, ones that were disinvested in during the 60s and 70s, are the sites of these social services in, in such large clusters. Bingo. John, you do have some questions in the chat. Um, oh. Lisa asks, have you spoken with anyone at DHS about these maps? No, I have not. I found before New York City Open Data had access to this data, I found DHS very unwilling to share data with us. We tried... Um, just one-on-one -on -one working with, uh, trying to talk to DHS staff, they wouldn't give us data. We tried a FOIL request um, and freedom of information law request, and they refused to give us data. Um, and it was only through um, Zachary's open data group that eventually pried some of this out. And the response has always been that 
they did not want to identify the location of shelters for confidentiality um, concerns. And, and that is perfectly appropriate to some degree because obviously we would not want uh, it to be known where, let's say, a, a battered person's shelter was located or a family shelter was located. But in all cases, our coalition had asked for aggregate data um, either by zip code or by community district, and we were r- rebuffed and thwarted at, 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 at every stage. And um, just a small note to that, um, while I appreciate the, the crediting of data for having more information available about city operations, uh, which is true, um, our, our group works with city agencies. So it really is the city agency staff who are responsible for publishing this information. Um, and also, I, I think I mentioned to you before, one of the reasons that there is so much information from city agencies is because in New York City, there's a law about what is required to be on New York City Open Data. Um, our office certainly works on all of that, but um, I, I certainly want to give credit where credit's due there. Okay, fair enough. Um, and I'm also just going to go down to uh, questions. Um, there's a question from Teddy that says, do you do you that standard operating procedures concerning data visualizations would help? I think it would be interesting if in addition to presenting raw data, um, there were more maps uh, that were produced from, from that data. I, I think, you know, if city agencies got into that more and, and had those maps available on open data, I think that would be a really great thing. I think that would be very useful. It, it's it's tough enough sometimes. I think Zachary would, would would agree to this. Sometimes it's tough enough just to get the data and get it in a um, comprehensible and, and clean form that can be used. Um, it might be a bridge too far to ask everyone to create maps on their data, but uh, but it's something. Zachary, could you answer that at all? Have you have you gone down that route of of, of mapping? So the, depending on the type of data um, that exists, if, if it is spatial data, then in general, when we're publishing it, especially if it's a newer data set, we will publish an equivalent map for it. Um, and, and we also we, we've been trying to link more. Um, create, like create more direct links between city data and city maps or other visualizations, whether it's a dashboard or some other web tool, um, and having it either in the description of the data or a link directly to it. Um, I would say another thing that, that could be really helpful here is we have a project gallery, and I'll put a link in the chat there. Um, for anyone who's created some sort of visualization or interpretation of New York City open data, um, we, we, we would link to that as well. It, it's sort of this community um, library of, of different different projects and, and, and ways open data has been visualized um, across myriad topics. Yeah, and, and to go to something that Mo wrote um, about, uh, about the difference between teaching GIS or, or this uh, digital mapping platform uh, as opposed to cartography, and, and I think this is also um, reinforced by, by Teddy, as citizens, when we receive visualizations from uh, corporate entities, from, from not-for-profits, from, from city agencies, from whoever, if something is not making sense visually, if it's not kind of, if the text and, and the visualization are not working somehow, um, my immediate question is, what's, what's not being represented here? What is not being shown? And I think that every time you take a look at a map or a visualization that incorporates a map, and we're all you know, looking at these maps of, the, of Ukraine and, the, and the, the conflict in Ukraine now, um, you know, really make sure that you do ask yourself questions or ask questions about what is being represented, what is not being represented, what is being exaggerated, what is being hidden. I think those are super uh, important. And and someone, I Teddy actually writes about. Um, he 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 write, Teddy writes as a program evaluator. I'm in shock that these maps passed editing and review. Clearly, someone wanted to show results. Um, and. I, I don't know if there's been any follow-up. I don't know if anyone other than myself has actually uh, taken a look at this uh, document and, and questioned the, the maps contained in. Um, I, I really don't know. And it, it w- I would love to know, but, but I don't. Um, and Citizens Committee has a shout out there. Citizens Committee's awesome. Um, I've applied for grants from them and they're a great organization. And the uh, I live just a couple of blocks away from the, the chief executive officer. So it's, it's such a great organization. Um, 
And has there been any discussion, uh, William writes, has there been any discussion with city council, state legislator, Lature to ensure that this data is made available? Um, the, the data from uh, open data is available. The question is whether anyone other than myself has actually taken the time to, to visualize it. And then the third step, of course, is has anybody then taken this to uh, people who have decision-making or legislative powers and ask them the difficult questions about why is it the way it is and what do we need to do as a society in order to make changes. That's pretty much it for the for the chat. How about um, anyone else want to unmute themselves and ask a question or make a comment? I guess um, building on Teddy's question about standard operating procedures for data visualization, John, do you have any recommendations for resources for people to learn how to visualize data better or what to look out for? No, but I think that, you know, maybe this is something that we should think about for Open Data Week next um, next year would be something like a newbie, uh, like getting your feet wet, the most basic things, um, something like that. I don't know. Have you have you all thought about that or, or worked on that kind of uh, Data 101? We do have classes on Open Data 101, sort of how to access and use open data. Um, as I mentioned, those are happening throughout the week. Um, but we don't have classes that are specifically about visualization one-on-one. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, I think as long as the visualization is of open data, um, that we'd love to have something like that as part of a future open data week. So um, we would definitely love to talk more. All right. That would be really interesting. All right. Anything else? I'm just wondering, if is there some uh, data that you wish you, you would go, that you get in an aggregate that you really wish would be at a lower level if it was available? Yeah, I think... Uh, you know, you may have noticed that the data I have access to or had access to was only community district based, right? I could only do a choropleth map. I was not able to do a symbol map because DHS, for the reasons of, of confidentiality, um, don't want to release the locations of shelters in the city. Um, so as... I as S sorry, actually, um, two years ago, I uh, played a little bit with uh, um, open data. I do notice that the shelter uh, location information was pretty limited, but I actually found a way to looking at uh, um, city building maintenance report. From there, they uh, have a label say it's shelter because every building have repairment and then they need to ask money to do repairment. They have to uh, disclose that building is shelter. You're using that where you, I used the past the seven years repair um, request, part it up and get a unique address. i using that where I can get a, the uh, total number of the bed as of that. But that's what I did play with two years ago. Yes, and there is something called the shelter scorecard. And this, these are essentially inspection records of every shelter um, that is licensed in the city. So inspectors go out and record whether they find, you know, vermin or dirt or leaky pipes or, or whatever. And those were, uh, scorecards are available. Uh, it's done on a monthly basis. Uh, they don't have uh, individual addresses, however. And, and I think um, it was somebody, perhaps it was uh, Teddy down there, about talking about the location of shelters, and I and I share that. I I, I think that um, I might be unwilling. I would not necessarily want the locations of these shelters to be uh, public information. But you'll notice what I was trying to get at earlier on was if you thought about the symbol map that I was highlighting from the city council document, they actually were located in the place where those shelters are. But this was not the kind of map that you could digitally hover over and then learn that this is at one, two, three, you know, Avenue A, for example. You just simply knew it's it's in that part of the neighborhood, but you would never actually know the actual address, which I think is is fair. So clearly the people in city council in 2017 were able to get much more fine-grained data than is available to the public for the obvious reasons. And they represented that data. I think in a in a in a responsible way, so as not to reveal the location of, let's say, a, a battered person's shelter. Did you do any uh, notice of uh, take any notice of uh, properties that are vacant, where there's a lot of wide open buildings that could be utilized to house people? Did that come across your research at all? 
Um, I haven't done that, but uh, you may know that uh, the former Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer was doing a vacant uh, storefront, vacant uh, building census and was trying to to do a kind of um, citizens ground truthing to, to locate those. Um, it's very difficult using the Department of Building data in order to get a sense of what, of occupancy, whether or not a building is occupied or not, because once a building is legally legally has a certificate of occupancy, um, it's very difficult from that to actually know whether there are people in it or or industries or businesses located. It's very difficult. Yeah, I hope we can find ways to find out how people are invested in these properties and uh, sitting sitting on these properties, you know, just just waiting for the hub to develop so they can cash in on their, their investments. Yeah. And uh, Eva Chan has has made a, a, a note here about um, other data that we've looked at. And we have uh, looked at, for example, overdose death rate data, which, as you know, has skyrocketed in the last couple of years, and how even though the data shows that uh, there are a number of neighborhoods in New York City which have had much higher overdose death rates than uh, East Harlem. East Harlem, as you may know, was chosen as the location for um, United States' first um, safe injection site. So uh, it's it's very clear that uh, the city, as, as a large entity, um, locates facilities for a variety of, of reasons. Some of them are data-driven. Some of the reasons are political. Some of them are um, complex, shall we say. And um, anything that as a society we can do to be more purely data-driven, I think we'll have a much more equitable society as well. Thank you for that, Eva. Okay, so let's, uh, it's, it's 801 um, and we can wrap this up as I had mentioned before, you can go to greaterharlem.nyc if you'd like to learn more about our organization um, and uh, what we're working towards. Also, if you would like a copy of this presentation, just uh, reach out at greaterharlemcoalition at gmail.com and I'll be certain, certainly uh, happy to send you a copy of this. And if anybody has contacts at DHS or um, any other agency that might be uh, interested in, in learning more about this analysis and um, and how they might incorporate that into future publications of theirs and uh, certainly at least the the perspective anyway uh, by all means I would be happy to have someone facilitate that uh, that linkage more than anything else but thank you all so much and um, have a great evening. Hope to be in touch and I'll see you at uh, future NYCDH week okay. events.